it starts from being service minded, right? Like first you give, don't expect to get anything from it. Don't walk into somewhere saying, I want this, this, this. That's in the back of your head. Like there's going to be a benefit. You don't know what that benefit was. And then on the other side, so similar to volleyball is get out there and get your touches in. Start testing things until you get on the court and start doing it. Stop wasting too much time behind a computer. Start there, but then use it as a tool. Like practice it, get your touches in. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Better at Beach Volleyball podcast. My name, as usual, is Mark Burick, and here we talk about everything you need to get yourself or your players better at beach volleyball. What we are going to do today is pretty cool because, spoiler alert, I get to have my brother on my own podcast, which is pretty sweet. Now, my brother is a retired FDNY firefighter. And he recently moved to Hawaii to start a coffee roasting company. They offer subscription services where you can have coffee delivered to your doorstep. They also do roastery tours and educational events where you can learn a lot about coffee. And what I learned while being there is how much I didn't know about coffee. And specifically for volleyball players, I will admit quite openly, I'm a caffeine addict. And I've maybe become a caffeine addict because I know how much it can influence your athletic performance. Caffeine is one of the most widely studied substances that we have and that people are pretty comfortable testing. And we know 100% that caffeine increases performance, increases stamina, and increases uh, concentration as well. And so I thought it would be, first of all, cool to hang out with my brother. And second of all, really good to introduce some nutritional aspects and and start talking a little bit to our players and our coaches about the supplementation and how it can increase performance. So today we're going to have a really good conversation. Uh, We're going to go deep into coffee. So if you love coffee, or even if you like it, this is going to be a great episode for you. If you like it, by the end of this, you'll probably love it. And I really want you guys to stay to the end of the episode because we're going to give everybody who's listening a very special offer from Better at Beach and Brian's company, Tradition Coffee Roasters. So if this is your first time listening, just know that we are Better at Beach and we run camps, we run clinics, we run online courses and coaching. And in our complete player program, If you want a team of coaches helping you year round and round the clock, I'm talking AVP and FIVP players and coaches that you can text, that you can show your videos, and that you meet with twice a week to improve your game, come on over to betterbeach.com. We are happy to help you improve your game as a player or a coach. And today specifically, we are going to talk about nutrition and supplementation. And if you want to dive a little bit deeper into nutrition and supplementation, we have an amazing program called the 21 day back to fitness challenge. And it's www.betteratbeach.com forward slash foundations. This is where we take you through 21 days of building your mobility, building your fitness and getting your diet in order so that you can prepare yourself for a heavy lifting session or a heavy lifting protocol. And if you choose to carry on with us, of course, we'll take you through our 60 day max vertical program. And the average increase in vertical leap right now is about four and a half inches for anyone who completes our program. So if you want to get started on that and you want to get our entire eight week nutrition challenge plus our mobility and weightlifting 21 day back to fitness challenge, you head on over to betteratbeach.com forward slash foundations. But again, I want you guys to make sure that you stay to the end of the episode where Brian's going to give us a very special deal on a sweet little coffee subscription or package built for you. So without further ado, let's get into how coffee and caffeine can help your volleyball game and how to do it best. Brian, Burrick, what's up, big brother? What's up, Mark? This is awesome. <laughs> Great to see you in the podcast world. You've always been huge in teaching. So to see you grow and into the man you are and reaching a broader audience, you're proud of you. Nice job. Thanks, Happy man. To be your guest. Thank you. Hey, look at us entrepreneuring. How about it? Yep. I didn't think Take that would happen. Guys from Queens. 
<laughs> two guys from Queens uh, figuring it out. Yeah. 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 It's cool. You know, we do want to get into volleyball, but the entrepreneur stuff. So I was a volunteer fireman for all of seven, eight months in Breezy Point, New York. And your job, and I know that I've told you this, that to be a firefighter is one of the best jobs, period. If I didn't play sports, if I wasn't coaching, I know 100% that I would have been into it because of the teamwork, because of the camaraderie, because there's nonstop action, nonstop problem solving. So before we go into a little bit of coffee and volleyball, could you just tell us why the FDNY might be the best job in the entire world? It is the best job in the world. There's no <laughs> might add to it. I love being a fireman. It was just a great part. You, you hit everything on the head. The camaraderie, it's the teamwork, it's the thinking, it's the risks, you know, that kind of keep everything exciting and being surrounded by people who are like-minded, service-minded people who want to help their community. You never hoped for a disaster, but you were always of the mindset that if there was a disaster happening, you wanted to be there and you wanted to be helping out. So that's part of the reason why I love the fire department. We had many different traditions and that kind of led into some of my coffee. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if, if any of your friends or coworkers know that you actually played college volleyball. I know that in high school, you got cut from your squad. You weren't six, seven yet. And I'm sure whatever coach that is, is still kicking themselves. But for our, to bring in our volleyball people who might not be the coffee people yet until the end of this episode, I, I want to know really, cause you and me have never really dove into what that was like. You were in high school you come from a tall family, maybe freshman or sophomore year, I'm not sure, but you tried out for your volleyball team. Why don't you take it from there? Yeah. So I guess trying out for volleyball, I have a few anecdotes and I've, I've still to this day, I sort it out because I have these conversations with my girls, one who will be on the AVP with you one day. If yeah. she saw the trajectory, <laughs> Got her. she just loves it. She's going to be tall and she, she's huge into it. But I guess when I went to try out for the baseball team, I went through a period of high school where I was... I wouldn't say lost, but I was testing every rule I could find. <laughs> and then at a certain point when I decided, okay, I'm either going to go to, you know, my grades were still there. So I wanted to either go to Penn State and pursue medicine, which I loved. And then, then all of a sudden the fire department really kicking, kicked into gear. So in some ways it squared me away of saying, hey, quit messing around and focus. So one thing that I had missed from life was organized sports. You know, I'd taken like two years off from most organized sports and went out for the volleyball team. I think I did pretty well, but ironically, and I'll say this, I may not have been good enough for the team. So okay. it's taken a long time to really come to that resolve. But in my heart, I think part of the reason was during some of my stages, I wasn't, I had a teacher that I really nudged in many of the wrong ways. Who knew she was my potential coach one day in <laughs> junior year. Uh. So when I tell my girls that story, they said, I tell them, like, that's sad and, and she shouldn't have cut you because she wasn't a fan of you. And I said, no, that's absolutely what she should have done. She made the right decision. Uh, as a coach, you have to think of how a, a player is going to listen to you, the discipline, how they're going to interact with people. And sometimes it's a very easy decision. And I would imagine that was a very easy decision for her to make the camaraderie of her team right. So I got cut from the team and continued my love for sports elsewhere. Nice. So essentially you were kind of a jackass in class or outside. You were like getting in trouble and pretty much all of it. Yeah. She <laughs> and she picked up on it. She was great. I hold her in high regard. It was just me who was the jerk. Do you think that, <laughs> that testing boundaries that young, I mean, you weren't like a terrible kid. I think you, you pushed boundaries. We'll say that. But do you think that prepared you to be in a leadership physical environment better instead of, you know, the guys who are, who are always towing the line and, and great rule followers? Do you think that your inability to follow rules early on or just a lack of desire to, do you think that created a leader out of you? You know, because you went on to be a firefighter in for what some people hold as the top firehouse in the entire world, like Rescue One in, in Manhattan. So do you think that that prepared you pushing boundaries or was it just where you had to straighten yourself out in, in order to become who you became? Yeah, I think, I definitely think people who push boundaries are people who are going to be successful as long as they can keep it under reins 
and know how to push boundaries or when to push boundaries. Uh, because I think people who push boundaries question things, you know, and to say this is how it was always done isn't always the right answer. You know, sometimes this is how it's always done is for a reason that should maybe be tested and questioned in its own way. Sometimes it's something that should be changed. So I think by questioning different rules or practices in a positive way. It's one thing to say, I don't agree with it, but then do you have two or three other answers that you want to test out that could actually add on it? Because nobody wants anybody who's negative, who's just going to question everything, but to say, hey, I've been thinking about it. This way it doesn't work. Let's try a, a different way of training. Let's try a different procedure. Let's try a different roast. Just because it's always been done this way isn't always the best answer. So I think it did help me in that aspect. Yeah, I think, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger's got his like six rules to life where he's like, he says, break the rules is one of his six rules of life. And then he says, don't break the law, but break the rules, you know, and test what's going on. Because if there aren't rule breakers, and I'm my college coach uh, labeled me a habitual line stepper. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, all right. It, but if nobody's testing the current rules, then there cannot be progress in any way, you know, so you can follow the path that everybody else did. And for the volleyball players out there who are looking for answers that that's kind of one of the special things about beach volleyball is that every player can really create their own game and that's why we get crazy players like adrian carambula like nicholas senna who's you know six one and doing it differently like people who have goofy footed approaches there are ways to do things and push boundaries that if no one tests it or no one questions it then the sport can't advance and like right now in beach volleyball people are jump setting Right. That's one of the things that people just didn't do for 10, 15 years. And all of a sudden, a couple of kids are doing and making everybody look like fools. And they literally changed the game. So now that every player, every guy is now doing like putting a jump set into their offense and the women are close behind. So it's pretty cool to, I think, test boundaries on a regular basis. And I think you can attribute a lot of the skills you developed as an entrepreneur to yeah, I want to learn what people are doing and see, but then is it right for me and how much of it is right for me? Oh, definitely. I think with anything that somebody dives into, you have to go in with, let me learn what people are doing. Let me learn why people are doing it that way. Uh, is there a reason or is it, again, just the way it's always be done? And as you start to learn from various experts, mentors, online, of course, has a ton of information, but then and you test it and then you get to a point where you start, you might start to create your own theories. And that's kind of the next stage of learning is saying, okay, I see how these four or five experts are doing it. I see it in practice. And then do I agree with it or do I agree with a portion of it? And then you start to create your own program of thought. And that's worked really well for me is first stepping into it with eyes wide open, teach me everything, yeah. finding another expert, teach me eyes wide open, another expert. And then you get to a point where I go, okay, I get the general philosophy. Right. Mark, it's, it's, like, it's like making a ceviche. I made a ceviche the other day. <laughs> The first thing I did is I scrolled down and I found six different ceviche re recipes. Ugh. And I was like, all right, I get the general idea. And I made my own ceviche recipe, right? That's like, <laughs> That's like our chili. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but you have to start off listening. You have to start off learning. If you can't model yourself after somebody in a way that you have to like allow yourself to be a follower, to be a later on. Mm. You know, for a few, you can't go in with questioning everything. But once you've been a leader, I feel like that really builds onto becoming your own leader and having your own theories with mm. sports, with coffee, with life. I like that. It's like survey the land first, you know, instead of just going in saying, this is how I'm going to do it. It's like, look at things first, then try it, see if it works for you and then start making decisions of if you want to change, but you can't come in with the mindset to say, I'm going to do 1000% my own thing, no matter what, yeah. that's going to take you a long time because you're going to make literally the same mistakes that people have made for a hundred years before you. Yeah. You played volleyball, indoor volleyball in college, right? <laughs> After getting cut. Yeah. After getting cut in high school. So, so you took a route, not often seen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny because, so I went to school and I, I'm pretty open about this. I thought college was an automatic. I didn't necessarily go for my education. I just thought the education part was an automatic. I was going to do it. But when I was choosing schools, I was choosing it for sports. And even when I transferred, I was like, all right, what's my closest route or fastest route to becoming a pro volleyball player? And that was after Delaware, after football, at Delaware, that, that was transferring to George Mason. You went to school specifically because you wanted to be a firefighter. So you went to John Jay 
community college, right? And yeah. then you chose to pick up baseball and you played volleyball for a season. What was that mindset like? Why were you getting into sports in college when you were you had the number one goal plus you were currently working as an EMT? So you chose to go to college so that you could be a fireman. You worked your way through college as an EMT and then you picked up a sport and then two sports. What yeah, the hell? I, Can you I walk hate, me through that? <laughs> I must hate myself in some, <laughs> on some level. No, when I think about some of the most stressful times of my life, that is college was is, is really high on that list. I pulled from Penn State. I had an, an offer there. And then I really decided to focus on fire science. And there were very few colleges that were doing a fire science degree, which is building construction, hazardous materials, a lot of chemistry, some hydraulics, some engineering into it. So it encapsulated everything that I wanted to learn. You don't have to go to fire science, get your bachelor's in fire science to be a fireman, but it was just another avenue for me to really learn about something. So when I got there, it was a city school, you know, it's a community college, people there from all all walks of life. Some some people had grown adults, people with kids, people working. So I wasn't going to get that college experience that I had been looking forward to. And part of me knew that. And I loved sports. So when I first got there, I saw a sign for volleyball and I tried out for volleyball, made it. And while I was practicing, the baseball coach was watching me practice and he cornered me in the elevator one day and he's like, hey, Bri, I'd like you to try out for baseball, you know? And I said, oh, you know, yeah, I watched you practice and would love for you to try out. So I started to practice with them. And, you know, a few couple of weeks later, I'm like, I'm waiting for the call from him. And he's like, I said, coach, when do I make the team? Uh, when do I know if I've made the team? He goes, ah, oh, you're on the damn team. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> this salty, scrappy guy. So I was, I did a, a dual sport for that semester. And then once spring happened, uh, after fall ball, I said, all right, this is getting to be a lot. And I did baseball full time, which was, you know, springs, summer on a league and then fall. In that time, I joined EMS. So that's when I started my fire department career. I had gotten into a program there called the Fire Cadets, where we were going to get onto the fire department. And it was a great program. And then there was a semester I had to take off so I could go through an academy. And then I even had to take off to go through fire academy. Everything got delayed. Oh, man. I mean, just to finish college, there was a number of breaks and <laughs> not sideways journeys, but you know, they're all in the same direction of your goal, but you had yeah. to take a break just to pursue your dream. And then you still got through college. A lot of people, you know, they go to their career dream and they never go back and they finish. Yeah. In line with that is one of my last semesters, I had two semesters left to go. And I, of course, taken off a semester for the fire academy, which I had finally gotten in. And I think I was a senior on steroids by then, but uh, <laughs> not literally. Then, Everybody. No. <laughs> Different podcast. Not <laughs> a super senior, as we call yeah. it. Was a, it was senior times senior. three years. Yeah. yeah. And I started one of my last two semesters of college. And as I was a fireman, bouncing from shifts to home and, and right at the beginning of the semester, 9-11 happened. Mm. So now, you know, that was obviously its own story deserving of its, of its own podcast. But just to share a little bit, it, it was a big challenge to bounce between going to school, the fire department, working down on the pile, attending funerals and trying to be an effective human. So it was tough. And then finally that next work through that semester. And then by springtime, I had two more classes and I was able to finish up, but I was proud in just a different way of completion than I guess some of the people that I began with school. I was proud that I had this certificate. It became like, you're not going to do all this work and not come out with a degree. Mm -hmm. A long story, but yeah. And a good story. So we fast forward to retiring, got a low back injury, <laughs> sucks, <laughs> low back injury, end up leaving the fire department, it's health issues. And the fire department says, Hey, uh, with your back, we don't know if something's bad going to happen. You got yourself back to pretty good condition. And then they were like, yeah, but it's still not going to work because yeah. so they potentially liability, right? In case somebody else needs rescuing or in case one of your teammates, you need to be there for them. And if your back goes out, they recognize your injury as career ending. Yes. Yeah. So that was sad because that was something I, I expected to do that till I was basically wheeled out of the firehouse. That was... Uh, you nearly uh, were. Some, <laughs> yeah, which, which, I, which I was, yeah. So I had that back injury, which led to a, a back surgery. And then, you know, now six months ago, three years out of the fire department, I had another back surgery. I don't recommend that to anybody. <laughs> uh, 
But in both cases, I went from being wheeled into an operating room to being able to walk on the way out, slowly walk. So at the same time, I consider it a successful surgery. Nice. And of course, with your family, make the wild move. Woo! Hawaii. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, in Oahu now to start your own coffee roasting and coffee subscription business where people can order coffee. I mean, I know I've been on your program for almost a year now, and I will say, man, I just love getting coffee sent at your doorstep and not having to add it to my shopping list just to know that that's taken care of. And I know you dive way deeper into the taste, the flavor, the making of it. For me, my favorite part of your company is that I just get the right amount of coffee every month that shows up to my doorstep. And you're pretty cool because you send me like all the different experimental flavors and different roasts. <laughs> so I love that. And I want to talk, you know, we, we have to get at some point into the actual performance side of caffeine and why it's going to help athletes, why it's going to help volleyball players. But before we do that, do you have a less than one minute elevator speech about your coffee company so that we can then like turn it into a performance and nutrition facility here. Yeah. So Tradition Coffee Roasters was born out of the tradition in a firehouse of sitting together at the beginning of the, of the day, having a cup of coffee and starting to join the team in mentality and physically and spirit. So that's where tradition comes from. And I have a longer story with that. But one thing that we do is we started off with e-commerce, so providing different coffees, whether it's different processes, different regions of all specialty grade coffee roasted by you, to real, to, yeah, <laughs> the top specs. And then we also have a wholesale business where we provide cafes and cafes, businesses, restaurants, hotels, provide them with wholesale numbers and service. And then we also get into education. So once you start learning something, I would say the best way to learn is to teach. And one thing I've really, really enjoyed is making people's coffee experience better by teaching them all the work that happens before I get the bean, what yeah. I do, and then what they could do at home. So it does all tie into, as you say, the convenience of having coffee show up at your door. No matter what your coffee experience, I know I can make it better. That's awesome. I like that. And what if I hate the taste of coffee? Is it something that I should still try to invest in? Because I know, I mean, I was what, 18? The only time I started drinking coffee, literally I was playing pro in Sweden. We had two hours of practice a day and then I could lift on my own time. And all Sweden does is drink coffee all day. As soon as you walk into a house, hey, want a cup of coffee? As soon as you, their version of like meeting up with each other and hanging out, they call it a fika, which is basically a snack and a coffee where you just sit, do nothing but talk and have coffee. So I got hooked on coffee at 22, 23 years old out of boredom, but now every day I love drinking it. So what would you say to the people who are like, yeah, coffee's gross, I'm done listening to this. So here's how it started for me. And this goes back to the firehouse. So my first day on the job in the fire department, you know what, from growing up, we drank tea. Oh, and yeah. only the best Lipton tea around. <laughs> Straight black Lipton <laughs> tea, no matter what, mom and dad are still every day. <laughs> That's right. So my first day on the job, they tell me, hey, kid, go make the coffee. Ugh. I don't know how to make coffee. I know, dunk tea, dunk tea bags. So <laughs> I make the best coffee I can. I'm looking around for my tea bag. No tea bags. But I did find a ratty old bag of uh Hot chocolate, good enough for me. I start stirring up my hot chocolate and all of a sudden the 15 boisterous Vietnam veteran slash salty firefighters behind me <laughs> go silent. And I'm just stirring my, I'm like, uh oh, somebody messed up and I bet it was me. But one of the guys was like, oh my God, chocolate, the kids drinking hot cocoa. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, your name's Coco. <sighs> Oh, uh, good friend, Betty Burwell coined that. And so I lived with that name for a little bit. Eddie, but, like Fireman Ed? No, different Ed. Different oh, okay. Ed. <laughs> so then, lo and behold, I was, again, in busy company. Hmm. You wake up a few, or you continue your night into day a few times, and you're like, I need to wake up. So you try this coffee. And sure, it tastes like mud and probably the, whatever's cheap and whatever's old on the shelf is what you get as a fireman. And you're like, wow, this stuff works. And I turned around like I found the Holy Grail, but nobody was interested. Have you guys tried <laughs> coffee? I'm telling them. <laughs> So that's when I really learned coffee as a tool. No. So to me, what I would say to somebody who's using coffee as a tool is, I, again, I can make your experience better. Like, let's get a better quality coffee. Later on, when I got involved in you know, some side jobs with specialty food, I also took a trip to Italy and I had one of the best coffee experiences that I had. And that began my coffee snob journey. Mm. So one thing I will say is I am a bridge between the two. 
I could hang out with the coffee PhD nerds. And I could also hang out with the guy who's like, give me a K cup and let me get out of here. I love those guys because all day long, I bring them back into creating a coffee experience in the morning for themselves. Yeah. You can have crap coffee and it's literally gross. And then, you know, you have a cappuccino with a little cinnamon sprinkled on it after yeah. having a steak dinner. And you're like, oh, wait a second. This is how I should be having dinner every night. <laughs> I should finish it off with this. Yeah. That's your moment. That's your coffee moment. You've gone through quite a few uh, pre-workout, no explode and some other. Oh man. Explode. <laughs> So I think I started drinking maybe like Red Bulls in high school, right? And yeah. that's when it started coming out. And energy drinks, I'm sure that in five, 10 years, our kids are going to be looking at us saying, you actually put energy drinks in your body. Like they'll look at it like when we're saying like, they used to put cocaine in Coca-Cola. Like, are you crazy? You guys drank that? And people are going to come back to the idea that coffee is just a good naturally sourced way of getting caffeine. And it is undoubted. It's documented time and time again in every study that caffeine improves athletic performance, focus, concentration, stamina, and your actual ability to lift higher weights or, you know, lift more weight. And so I found that I found the kick from Red Bull. But then as I went into exercise science in college, I said, Oh, it's actually like, I'm going to be better at practice today. If I put in a little caffeine, Oh, okay, I'm going to be better for this match. If I add a little caffeine, and that became a regular part of my supplementation. I'd say I'd gone a little overboard now to where little bits of caffeine are like I need it in order to not get a headache. So I don't want people to listen to this and go that far and just crush themselves with caffeine. But I will say that everybody, if you're interested in peak performance, if that's your thing, like to, to find what it's like to get your body to the next level and you want to do it, of course, legally and without throwing in crazy hormones and drugs, like you should start seeing what a little caffeine kick or a caffeine supplementation or coffee does for your practice for your game and you should document that a little side note little like commercial for us guys if you go ahead and you right now it's on screen but if you're on a podcast you're just listening if you head over to better forward slash nutrition what we do is we have a hydration and eating checklist for you and we give you a documentation sheet which forces you not forces you but it allows you to write down everything that you drink and eat before and after practice. And then it takes you through a questionnaire that says, Hey, what did you eat beforehand? Okay. Rate your performance level. Now rate your focus level, because that's a big thing. People like rate their performance, but they also don't necessarily rate their focus because if you want to improve your passing and then you go into practice and you think about it for five minutes, and then you never think about passing again, because you're so pissed off that you're getting blocked all the time. You're not actually focused on passing, right? So the important part is rate your focus and your performance. So if you guys want to jump into that and you want to see what it's like to track your eating, track your hydration and track what you're putting into your body, and then see how it relates to your performance. We've created a really nice, easy take home PDF program for you. And you can find that at betteratbeach.com forward slash nutrition. But my story is that everybody should be trying. If you're interested in peak performance and you haven't experimented with a little caffeine, there is something you're leaving on the table. Yeah. And, and you and I have interesting, like almost like before this, you and I have definitely talked about, you know, before you even get to caffeine, are you doing everything? Are you getting a good night's sleep? Part of that nutrition and body is solid workouts before solid night's sleep. And there's nights where there's, that's just not an option for you. Mm -hmm. Or there's nights when maybe you could have done better with your pre-evening workouts that you might've been doing, but having a good night's sleep is definitely the beginning. And I think this is really for people who are looking to, Hey, I'm, I'm doing all these things. And now is there a way that I could use caffeine to give me a boost? and still get I like those, that those benefits yeah where you're not using it as like a crutch right or you want to make sure that everything else is in point and now now what can help not what can get me out of a ditch because yeah. if you're not sleeping if you're not working out the right way and if you're eating like crap yeah okay this caffeine is going to take you from negative 50 to negative 40 <laughs> you got to fix all of the other stuff first and then see what you can do from there that's yeah that's the other side of that for me yeah, I like it. And it's a good point for everybody because yeah, you can you can chug yeah, energy drinks all you want, but if everything else is you're treating your body like crap because of what you're putting in, that's not going to help you really. You got to yeah. you got to fix the foundation first. And Mark, you brought up a real interesting thing with your coffee intake. So, 
and I'm not a doctor. I'm not, you know, the, my expertise isn't necessarily with caffeine while, mm. while I still understand the benefits and how to get more to you from a roasting side, as well as a coffee provider. Like you and I, we know we're working on, on, a, on a blend that's going to be actually for you with the best flavor, but still giving you some, an extra punch in there. Some kick. Uh, some kick. Yeah. You need a little extra kick, but I just said, maybe we should dive into to some of that. Heck yeah. Well, I mean, I think the first question that comes to mind when everybody looks at coffee and caffeine, because we've all been like in the gas station coffee and we all know it sucks, but <laughs> you see like the turbo boost coffee, you know, and you see the dark roast and the light roast. And my question is, if I want to get the maximum amount of caffeine, what coffees should I be choosing? Yeah. So, you know, what has the most caffeine, what has a light roast or dark roast? There's a few different categories of coffee varietals, you know, Liberica, there's Arabica and Robusta, right? Okay. So the two main ones, Arabica coffee, fine Arabica coffee, people have found tastes better than Robusta. Robusta coffee has more caffeine. Hmm. So if you were to tell me, Brian, I don't care what it tastes like. Can tradition coffee roasters make me a coffee that just has the most caffeine. I would source hundred percent Robusta. I'd find the best quality I can, and then I would roast it for you. And that's the best way to do it. Another way you can do it is just by drinking more coffee. Another way you can do it is by using more coffee in your brew. So a typical number that we use in coffee is, you know, we usually do grams and milliliters, but 17 to one ratio, or it's still really simple, 15 to one ratio. So for one gram of coffee, I'm going to use 15 grams of water. One gram of coffee, 15 grams of water. Oh, that's a nice way to think about it. Is that like in my coffee pot when I'm doing that machine? Is that? Yes. That's why oh I always have God. a scale. That would make it so much easier because then I could just, all right. So if I have one cup, so yeah. Right. So, so if well, I'm measuring my coffee <laughs> grinds out, right? Yeah. How do we do this? So first thing I would do is measure out your, take your scoop of coffee, right? How much does it weigh? How much does the actual coffee weigh? Oh, this is pounds, you, not containers. You know, no, definitely a container. So or you take grams. your bag that I sent you and you take yep. a scoop, right? How much coffee are you actually, do you have on there? And then if I have 10 grams of coffee, I'm going to grind it, put it back on the scale, and I'm going to add 150 grams of water, hmm. which is okay. milliliters, right? But grams. So I just multiply it by 15 anytime I'm going to do it. That's a solid ratio. That's a nice strong ratio. Okay. Does that make sense? Is, is that with filtered coffee only? Or is that, you know, if I'm looking for the one to 15 ratio, so I'm going to weigh my coffee. Is there a way to do it without weighing it for people who have, who don't have a scale? No. Okay. <laughs> I would say that you should really get a scale. You should get a good grinder, you know, a nice bird grinder. So that's a little bit of the snobby side of me coming in with that. But what I say in response to me playing devil's advocate is anytime you're brewing coffee, it's just about keeping the parameters even. So if you're doing one scoop of coffee, mm -hmm. brew it with the amount of water that you would usually use. Is it too light tasting? Is it not strong enough? If it's not strong enough, add more coffee. So you can do it with a scoop, right? It's just about saying, okay, yesterday I remember doing one scoop. I need more coffee. And this time I'm going to do it a scoop and a half or two scoops. Again, you're going to taste. Everybody's taste is going to be slightly different. So I think that's important. The next part of that is how much caffeine am I getting? You know, kind of just to bring it into uh, to, to our discussion here. And one interesting aspect of caffeine is it's super soluble in water. So it's like, as you start to brew your coffee, one of the first things to come out of your coffee bed is caffeine. What? Mine. I know. So like those first few drips when you're, impatiently waiting for your coffee pot to fill and and i take it and i'm just like i just need half a cup right now you know and i take that i'm getting like ca technically the most caffeine oh, yeah. out of those initial you, drips i would say maybe not the initial drips yes you're going to get caffeine but if you used half the water you'd have concentrated you're going to take out more of the caffeine uh. then you have enough time to take out the coffee solubles sorry okay. i always have trouble with that yeah big words are tough man I'm saying, man, <laughs> Those no three syllables always, <laughs> once we go above two, I hate it. Yeah. So in coffee, we always go to total dissolved solvents when we start to figure out our strength in coffee. And that's as we, how much coffee am I actually dissolving in order to get my brew? And the finer the grind you use, the, the higher the temperature of water, the more you're going to actually dissolve in there. Caffeine is interesting because it just jumps into the water and goes on through, right mm. through the filter, right through everything. So yeah, you can do that. So if I don't like the taste of my coffee, well, first of all, okay, so let's go back to the beginning. So Rustica is what I should look for. Is that found in bags? Robusta. Robusta. Yeah. 
Thank so you. Robusta is, yeah, it's a variety of coffee. Okay. Is that it's a specific grown, bean it's that's grown it's, somewhere? Yeah, it's typically low grown. A lot of it in Indonesia, uh, India has a lot of Robusta. It's considered an inferior quality as far as tasting goes, huh. but it has nearly double the caffeine of Arabica. Ah. So one of the reasons it has all that caffeine is because it's a natural resistant to pests. So you don't need the high elevation. You're going to get a, when they grow it, they're going to have larger volumes that they're going to be able to pull. Hmm. And it's also a natural pest resistant thing. Interesting. So you can yeah. resist pests with your coffee now. I love <laughs> it. It naturally does that with the caffeine that's in there. Well, that's great. So yeah. why aren't people like just like throwing coffee grinds around their farm fields? Why are we using all these nasty chemicals and stuff? That's, I, it seems like a decent answer. We should just have showers of caffeine. Oh my God. That would be great. Would love that. <laughs> I would love that. Okay. So we've got the two different types, but you could always just add more coffee. Like if you want extra caffeine, just drink more coffee. And I want to talk a little bit because everybody talks about, well, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do the caffeine because it's dehydrating. It's dehydrating. Well, caffeine is a diuretic. Right. So it will open up your pathways and make you go a little bit more. But what's widely been studied is that for American coffee, right, you're making it through a brew. It's not an espresso or a cappuccino or anything. The amount of water that we actually have in a black cup of coffee made in the, the American style through brews and stuff that normally replaces the amount of water that you would lose from the diuretic nature of caffeine. So when people say that coffee is dehydrating, not necessarily if you're taking in that normal average American coffee. However, what people, they do get dehydrated if they drink coffee as if it were the hydration part. So if you're going to drink coffee, that doesn't count as you adding fluids to your body because that'll come out as net zero, right? So for the sports performance geeks out there and people who are trying to you know, prepare themselves for a tournament or a practice, don't think that you can go off to the side of your practice, drink coffee, and because you're having caffeine, it's going to be better or, or your performance is going to go up because now the dehydration effects come in because you aren't, now, hydrating during practice, you're staying at zero for your actually what you're intaking, and that's not going to allow you to battle the hydration effects. So if I'm giving recommendations to people, you should have the same amount of water as you have with your coffee. So every cup of coffee, you should be drinking a water next to if you're thinking about staying hydrated at an elite level and keeping your performance up. So don't drink coffee as like your Gatorade. Don't drink it as the only thing. And if you keep in your mind, all right, I had my cup of coffee. Now I have to make sure that at minimum, I'm drinking the water to match that cup of coffee. Yeah. So important for people to know. We also want to talk about like milligrams, how much caffeine is in a cup of coffee? What's the primary or the best amount of caffeine? And I know from the research that we've done for this and prior that you're hoping for, you know, Honestly, about 400 milligrams of caffeine, which sounds like a lot because that could be four cups of coffee. That's shown to have the most performance upgrade with the least negative effects, right? Without getting too crazy jittery. Everybody's going to have their sensitivity to caffeine, right? Figuring that out. I think that's, that's a, a strong point. Just caffeine is going to hit everybody differently. My wife, Lindsay, she really can't have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea that, that's caffeinated because she gets jittery. She feels like tingling. So she has a super hypersensitivity, which is even made more sensitive because she avoids it, right? Okay. So when you find where's coffee, uh, caffeine found, it's, it's coffee, it's found in tea, it's found in chocolate. So these are like natural sources of caffeine. Most of that she doesn't have, but she does drink a lot of tea, but usually not caffeinated. So then we have to say, okay, where are we going to get this caffeine? And here, when we're looking at coffee, it's important to find like a high quality coffee that's not including any other chemicals. I have customers that change throughout the day. So we talked a little bit about the sensitivity of coffee. There's also a, a back end sensitivity where you're getting closer to your sleep. You don't want to have coffee. I used to be able to drink coffee and go right to bed. Mm. Then it was 6 p.m. and it was 4 p.m. Now it's like 3 p.m. If I'm not done with my coffee consumption, I'm not going to sleep soundly that night. And I think everybody where so they are. Now, if you're saying that, like, if you drink coffee right now after 3 p.m., it's going to affect your sleep. Yeah. 3 p.m. is my cutoff. But if I have a coffee at four or five, mm -hmm. yeah, by the time I get to bed at 10, 11, it's still kind of just waning effects. But and that goes, hours, that goes with the science, right? Yeah. It's six, it's about six hours for 
the last caffeine to be out of your bloodstream. Yeah. Right. So yeah. last time you drank coffee, you can expect that it's completely out of your bloodstream or filtered out six hours from there. Yeah. And the science says within about an hour, you're going to start feeling the most benefits of caffeine. So if you were going to look at, hey, how am I going to use caffeine, which is such a weird like way when we talk about a, a drug that's out there and chocolate that we give our kids and uh, <laughs> like, how are we going to use caffeine? You have to look at like when you want that peak performance for how long you want that. And then look at your own sensitivity and your own resistance. One of the, uh, not resistance, help me out, Mark. Tolerance you've built up. Tolerance. Thank you. Thank you. Jeez. Uh, how much tolerance you've built up. So one way that I would say for you, Mark, is... Are you looking for that peak performance every workout that you do? Or do you just want to use it on game day? Because if you're just using it on game day, maybe you cut back all your other days and then you use it in, you know, as you go into game day. Mm. Other people want it for their practices. But then when you take an off month or you know, a slowdown season, maybe that's where you're like, hey, I know I'm going to like not train as hard or train in different ways. Maybe you're focused more on flexibility and endurance, but you don't need that hype. Yeah. Maybe that's a time in your calendar where you cut back on your caffeine. I'm not helping my business here, but <laughs> cut back on your caffeine. And <laughs> that's when you subscribe to the decaf. <laughs> that's right. We have pauses. You can pause at any moment or, and, uh, and start it back up whenever works for you. But I want you to get the most out. I don't want to waste anyone's money. Hmm. Okay. So if we're looking at a practice, and this is something that I do too, when I'm at practices, like, yes, I still have caffeine. So it's part of my regular routine, but I do hold myself back when I know that I can. So when I'm scheduling my practices during the week, if I know I got a tournament that weekend, I'm going to try to curb my caffeine intake. I'm not saying I'm eliminating it. I still want to maximize the practice. But I don't want to get to the point where I need to have so much caffeine in my system to feel any sort of different effects or, or increased focus because your adrenal glands, your hormones, they get used to it. And eventually uh, when you're releasing this adrenaline and caffeine releases in the end, it releases a little bit of adrenaline so that you can focus, but then your pituitary glands, the, the glands that are supposed to do this on their own for like a fight or flight response or when you're getting excited, eventually they get mixed signals because they're so used to you being, they're so used to the chemicals being that they lose the signals to generate it when it's time to perform. Right. Yeah. So they don't know how to like get you excited naturally because they feel like, well, you're always excited. So there's no threat and you're hyped up right now. Like we see all the hormones in your blood, but there's no bear around. So why do we even need to produce this? And that's a big problem that people don't understand is that they want to try to maximize this every practice. Yeah. You can't constantly have it in your system because your body has to learn how to get yourself excited. Yeah. And caffeine is also interesting because really what it does is it tricks your body into not being tired. It's not really maybe a, a stimulant in its truest in its truest form, but it just kind of like puts that waste that your that your brain's saying, hey, it's tired and kind of fills it up into your body saying, oh, maybe I'm not tired because losing track of what substance it is. Again, not a caffeine major. But the idea behind it is that it tricks your body into not being tired. Mm. And at some point you do have to pay the piper, you know? Yep. Okay. So we're making sure that if we're getting our caffeine in, we're getting our coffee in, we're thinking, and here's the meat of it. And guys, before we go on, before we give you this, and before anyone heads out, we do want to say that <laughs> my brother's not sponsoring me, but I, of course, I want to support him. And I'm telling you right now that I've, I've been a part of his company for the last year. I love getting the coffee at my doorstep every month, the exact amount that I need so that there's no extra, there's no more. And it shows up and it's delicious and it's a family run business. I mean, my brother's got two daughters. He's got a wife. They, you know, he put his life on the line for 20 something years for everybody in New York city. And this is something that you could love to support. So for everybody who's listening, for all of our listeners and all of our volleyball players and anybody who's joining right now, Brian has offered a 10% discount for anything on his website. If you go to traditioncoffeeroasters.com and you'll find your way through it. We've gone through his website. We know that it's easy to find what you want and what you need. And you can, we're going to talk about a few special blends that Brian has and, and which is more caffeinated and, and what you want to look for in your taste and flavor profile. But if you want that 10% discount and you want beautiful handpicked and roasted by Brian coffee at your doorstep every month or anything else that they offer, you have the coupon code better at beach. So on checkout, when you go to traditioncoffeeroasters.com, you get a 10% discount for anything that's up there. And that coupon code is better at beach. You know, I would love if you 
support my brother. And of course, I mean, 99% of you are drinking coffee anyway, so you might as well keep it in the volleyball and friendly family, traditioncoffeeroasters.com. The coupon code, again, is better at beach. Go ahead over and take a look or open up a tab right now if you're just listening. And if you're in the car, just have the person next to you open that on your cell phone <laughs> so you can have coffee waiting for you when you get back from your road trip. Yeah, that's awesome, Mark. Happy to provide for you and all your followers. You've got a great group and I love athletes and consider myself part of the team, so to speak. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you're also in Oahu, so you're running like coffee roastery tours. And, of course, volleyball and beach volleyball have a deep, deep history in Oahu. So if you guys are headed out to Hawaii and you want to learn anything and everything there is to know about roasting coffee, the different ways it's made, try a bunch of different blends and brews and roasts and beans, uh, you can head on over to them for a coffee roastery tour as well as a tasting experience, which I think is, is really cool. And it's an, I mean, for me, I've always thought like it was an easy date or an easy like business meeting, like, Hey, you know, let's go over and learn about coffee. And it'll be a nice little innocent hour, hour and a half experience that we can enjoy. And it's not, you know, and then you can part ways, you know, if you're a Tinder or Bumble kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfect date. And to do some of the classes would are great. We source globally. So Central South America, and then a lot of local coffee. So Kona region, Kau, uh, just south of Kona here, as well as some stuff that is growing here on Oahu, Maui. But we take everybody through it, take a little bit through the production side of it, the farmer side, because a lot of our, what we do is because of them and their hard work. And when we source our specialty grade coffee, a few of the other things that we look for, Mark, which is really at the source of helping people, we always say, you have great coffee. It meets the profile that we want, that our customers want. What else are you doing for people? What else are you doing for the land? So you'll find a lot of our coffee bean are either organically farmed, women-owned farms, some are Rainforest Alliance, basically just trying to figure out other ways that we can support people who are also putting support in, in other, other aspects. Mm. So, Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit self-serving, right? Because if somebody's not taking care of the land that they're growing their coffee on, or, or it's you're not creating a place where agriculture is self-generating and regenerating and you destroy your own business along with the rest of the earth and whatever else we're doing so it's smart to do it that way from <laughs> not just from a hey it's good for everybody standpoint but it's also good for you because it continues that business and in a healthy way so you can give people good coffee instead of tons of pesticides and chemicals and stuff in their coffee yep yeah are there any um can, can i ask you to throw some people under a bus are there any coffees that we should watch out for that are adding chemicals that you kind of don't want or you don't get a pure caffeine taste or, or sense so you don't get that kick or it just comes with too much other crap that you're putting in your body so i would say that most places that are doing specialty coffee are moving away from there what i would pay attention to is decaffeination process so how coffee gets decaffeinated there's chemicals that be, that can be used to pull the caffeine out of the out of the coffee bean itself the one that we use is a water decaffeination process or swiss water decaf as it's more widely known in that sense instead of putting your coffee into a solution using chemicals to draw out the caffeine it's basically put it into a heat bath done off-site by people by businesses that that's their main business they'll put the coffee the green coffee unroasted into a bath of water heat the water and like i said the solubility of caffeine goes into the water and they run it through filters and those filters pull out all the caffeine what they do with that caffeine is they sell it to pharmaceutical companies excedrin Hmm. And then beverage companies that are using caffeine in their drinks for as a natural caffeine. So oh, interesting. Of, produce, but yeah, it's kind of like we'll take your garbage and then we'll sell your garbage to someone who else. It's a, huh. it's a good business model for them and a little more involved than we, what we want to get, what we want to do here. But if you're looking for a nice organically decaffeinated coffee, check out our Swiss water decaf here. Other places will do that or a CO2 decaffeinated process where they're okay. using carbon dioxide. But okay. Is that like on the labels or anything that people can easily find? It should be. I mean, if, if you're going through the process and spending the extra money to get a decaffeinated coffee through these a processes, good decaffeinated coffee. Yeah. a good, healthy decaffeinated coffee that you could feed your kids like I do, you kind of want to highlight it. So that's something that we do highlight. Okay. So back to the caffeine content with coffee, right? It, generally one cup of coffee and correct me if this is the same as espresso, but one serving of coffee we're looking at somewhere between 80 and, and 120 milligrams of caffeine, right? Yeah, you're right in there. Okay. And that's with espresso 
or with basically one of the filtered cups of coffee, you're looking at 80 to 120. And we're thinking that for supplementation, if you're looking for supplementation to experience effects, of course, everybody's got different sensitivities. So start going step by step, but two to 400 milligrams of coffee is right around where most people are experiencing that the peak effects before they go. <laughs> essentially go nuts or get jittery yeah. right, with that caffeine. So probably anywhere from two to four cups of coffee is what we're looking at in terms of being able to supplement that. And if we're doing it for a practice or for a match, the first effects of caffeine, you're going to feel at about, because it's so soluble, like you said, you're going to feel that at about 15 minutes. And that goes up to like max absorbency into your, or into your bloodstream where most of the caffeine is present. That's at about an hour could be up to two hours, depending on how much you ate, how much is in your stomach and how it's allowing to get through your bloodstream. So to be safe, let's say that you would like to ingest some coffee. And if it's your first time, go light and one cup of coffee, you'd be fine. Right. But you want to start adding that coffee or the caffeine into your system. I'd say about a half hour before your match or before your practice so that it can ride out so that you want to hit that max peak. Maybe if you want to hit it on the first point, that's fine. But then you might need to, if you drink coffee or, or whatever you're drinking an hour before your match or a half hour before your match, and you have a longer bout, then you also want to supplement it with like little bits as you go forward, because you also don't want to experience where you're at a high energy and then you feel it start to drop down. You'd like to keep riding it at a plateau, right? However, you're not going to go crazy and make sure it goes over the top so is that right would you say like two cups of coffee maybe three about an I love hour the way, I love the way you're thinking about it and i love trying to come up with like solutions for it and how i would best utilize it and i think about my day and if i have a, if I have a long workout long day where me it's more on my feet right now than doing much of a workout mm. but i like coffee to start my day so i would say okay i'm gonna make myself this monster cup of coffee and i'm gonna sip it a little bit in the beginning and if I were on my way to the beach, I'd probably throw in a bunch of ice cubes on the side. So wow. as that coffee's cooled, I'm supplementing with ice so that I could sip it throughout my training regimen or my tournament. And then by the end of it, I also benefiting from the extra hydration from the ice. Art. You know, so then what's neat about coffee is, and we go through this with some of our sensory training, is as we evaluate coffee and we, and we cup it or, or sip it, the flavor changes as it cools. So one thing you'll notice with our coffee is even as it cools, you're still getting a lot of the sweetness, the, the, the body, the acidity, everything's getting highlighted depending on which coffee it is. We have some white roast coffees where the acidity is more prominent and then meaning brightness of the coffee and then others where the sweetness. So like my firehouse blend is a great example of it as it, it goes from this sweet, rich cup and as it cools, it starts to get like this syrupy, mapley undertone where there's still the strength. And so the next time you're having a cup of coffee, Mark, try it when it's warm. Okay. Try it a half hour later. If you can write down it or just think about what flavor notes and it's going to change and it's, it's a wild experiment. But it's one thing that really interests me in coffee. Like, why does it change? How come just temperature and my perception on my tongue is different than it was 15, 20 minutes ago? So when we evaluate coffee, it typically goes for 45 minutes where we're just letting the coffee cool and taste and, and cup. That's wild. It blows my mind that there are coffee people out there. I, I saw that one movie that was like Jack Nicholas and Morgan Freeman where they're like getting old and, <laughs> and they drank the, the, the roach poop coffee or like or coffee made Cat from poop. poop. Cat poop. Yeah. Uh, Kopi Quad or I, I forget the name, but it's, yeah, cat poop coffee where the cat or <laughs> sort of a cat digested and helps out. But with the fact that, you know, and, and I'm not a wine connoisseur either, but I know how people pay attention to that and that there are coffee connoisseurs who are paying extreme attention to the flavor, the temperature, how long you roast. I mean, you skipped over it a little bit, but you said that coffee beans are green and I never knew that until I went to your spot. I was like, what? Yeah. They're green? Like the coffee mm -hmm. beans are green and then you actually roast them over what a fire and an, an onion and then that is is that where the flavor comes from like if you roast them too long it be it tastes yeah. like charcoal i mean co coffee beans aren't beans at all which is the, the a, a bit of a joke it's, it's seeds. damn it it's two seeds in a of a cherry which are we for some reason try to confuse people by calling them beans but they are <laughs> seeds of a cherry huh oh yeah. and i got my peaberry coffee uh Woo! png papua new guinea delicious that's where it's, 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 it's a single. It was fruity. I thought it was a little too fruity for my taste. 
Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed it, but I think some of the other ones, like your firehouse blend, oh, that's been my favorite so far for sure. But I am excited for the volley brew or whatever we're going to call it. I guess we're making on the back end, we're making a specialty coffee just for volleyball players. I want it to like taste beachy, taste light, but have high caffeine content. So just be prepared. I don't know if it'll be out by the time this episode airs, but if it is, we'll include it in the show notes. But we're making a volley brew or a, a coffee specifically so that you can drink for your tournaments and for your practices. That's going to be. High caffeinated and nice and summery and beachy in its nature. And it's going to be delicious with all of that. Hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So this is a good lesson for all athletes. I think if we're going to sum up your coffee intake, first of all, if we're doing a whole rundown, right, you need to start small and see how it affects you. And I would recommend writing this stuff down. You know, you practice on Monday, see what your energy is like. Just rate your energy. Just one through 10 on a piece of paper, write your energy. If you need help, just sign up for our program at betterbeach.com forward slash foundations and we'll walk you through it. But it's super easy. You don't need that program to do it. Just write down how your energy was after a non-cup of coffee. Then since we know that the max effects of caffeine are going to be felt about an hour, 15 minutes to two hours, but about an hour after you consume it, start with this, a half hour before your match or before your practice or before your lift. You take a cup of coffee, write down your energy feels after that. Hopefully you've slept the same both nights and so you're controlling some variables. Then after that, the next day, two cups, next day, three cups. And just see where your energy is and how you feel it. I think most people don't write their stuff down enough so they just play this giant guessing game instead of becoming scientific with their performance right you want to make sure that you're actually measuring this stuff so that you can do it if you're playing a tournament this is a long day right so you can't just pile on with your caffeine or coffee consumption so this means that you're going to have to take less coffee less caffeine throughout the day but still hit those little peaks so that half hour before each match, maybe you're having one cup of coffee, right? And so that way it runs, because remember the caffeine content in your blood, it's not erased until six hours later. So each time you have another cup of coffee, you're going to end up like compounding that. It's not gonna be quite gone. So you're gonna ride a high and then you're gonna hit a new peak. You're gonna ride a high and you're gonna hit a new peak. For some of you that might mean jitters, for some of you that might mean really great energy where you're fired up, you're focused, you're moving faster, and you're making better decisions, actual better mental decisions, right? But you're going to have to explore that. So if you're waiting until the beginning of the second set to have your caffeine, you might be done with that match before you even feel the effects. So if we're talking about supplementation, make sure that that we're hitting that hour to half hour window right before to see if you can start writing that caffeine high for your coffee. And if you are drinking, right, we're talking about making sure you stay hydrated. That coffee is a diuretic, so it will pull water out of your body. However, it's not necessarily in itself dehydrating. It just means neutral, which means that you must drink extra water. So if you're thinking that you're going to drink black coffee when you're preparing for a match or something like that, remember that your stomach might start feeling full if you have the black American like watered down coffee. Uh, Europeans would call it watered down, right? The watered down coffee, and then you might feel a little too full in your stomach. So Brian, is there an option where people can have like less in their stomach, but still get the caffeine? Like, is that where espresso comes in or cappuccino so that I don't have to feel so bloated? Yeah. So you could definitely, again, it comes down to the thing with espresso is you're using, you can use the same amount of coffee. So for a double espresso here, we use 18 grams and you could also brew a cup of coffee for 18 grams. The thing with espresso is you are using a much smaller amount of co- of water in order to brew your espresso, right? A couple ounces. Mm-hmm. So in that, you're getting a concentrated beverage. You're using the same amount of coffee as a cup of coffee, but it's concentrated. And yeah, you're getting more bang for your buck in, in an espresso as far as volume goes. Okay, yeah, right. So it's going to be the same amount of caffeine, but less water. So now I might, oh, you still might need to drink then two cups of coffee. So it might almost, or sorry, two cups of water, right? Yeah. So it might yeah. almost serve you to drink the American cup since it's the same amount of caffeine diuretic, right? And then you're adding the water if you have an Americano, but you're not adding the water if you have the espresso. So either way, you still need to add like two cups of water with one serving of caffeine coffee. I guess, yeah, hydration is a whole different thing. I would hope that especially athletes at your performance level, you guys are so focused on hydration that it's almost not even a concern for you guys because it's just second nature 
Uh, but for definitely some of the more novice coffee drinkers, it's something to consider, especially working out hard on a beach or getting your workout on. Nice. Hey, we got a couple more minutes here, but I kind of want to know what you learned from sports as a kid and what you learned from fire department as well. And I know this is a little weird. I've always considered firefighting as a sport in a way because it's unpredictable. It's always different environments and different situations that can change right? And you still need technique, you still need skill, you still need teamwork and communication. So to me, in a way, firefighting has been like the closest job that there could be to playing a sport. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you've carried from your sport background or your firefighting background that you're loving doing or you think has been so crucial to you that you learned there and you've taken into business and entrepreneurialism? I think to like sum it all up for like things that I find exciting are putting myself in uncomfortable situations, you know, whether that's in sport or with a career or with an operation or here with the business, but constantly challenging myself and making myself feel uncomfortable. Even as a firefighter, I remember, you know, when I was first in a ladder company, and then I would say there's some areas, no matter how interesting the job is, that it becomes monotonous. So going to special operations was a huge way to challenge myself. And then later on, becoming an officer was another way to challenge myself. So about every, every few years, I want to find a new way to make myself uncomfortable. And the business has been one of those. So trying to enter a whole different industry from the complete ground up with just nothing more to start with other than a passion for coffee, passion for brewing and excitement about roasting and getting to into a position where I'm able to up the games of others and share some of the experience that I've learned. So if I were to take something from sports from childhood, it's just to a piece of advice. It would be just to keep finding ways to make yourself uncomfortable. I think you use that a little bit with muscle building, right? If you're these microscopic tears, it's like exceed the comfort of your muscles. Well, here I exceeding the comfort of my life by putting myself into a new challenge. And that's something I really love. And the other side of it is, you know, a great chief told me once, Brian, he goes, the best way to learn is to teach. And I really uh, wholeheartedly believe that because it forces you to be on point with your material. It forces you to question your material mm. and you get questioned. And the more you get questioned, the more you hear other people's viewpoints and the more open you are to new ideas. So I love the idea of teaching to learn. I love that. I had that experience the same way where, you know, we got taught the same thing from a bunch of different club and high school coaches. And then, you know, people ask me about it and I start teaching it and I start saying it. And I'm just like, yeah, but if I had to play devil's advocate, because I always play devil's advocate with myself, right? I'm always like, I attack my own things to make sure that nobody attack attacks what I say the next time, yeah. or at least I have a good defense or explanation for it. And sometimes the answer is, guys, we actually don't have any studies for this, but all of the current top coaches in the world teach it this way. All the best players do it this way. So that's what we're doing. You know, if you figure it out, let me know. And literally I'll be coaching a camp and I'll, I'll let people know exactly where I stand on it. And they respect you more when you're just like, oh, okay, he's not going to BS us ever. As soon as you tell a good hard truth, people gain a lot of trust in you and they say, He's never going to BS us. If he doesn't know an answer, he's going to say, I don't know, or I don't know why. But we have a lot of those skills in volleyball where it's been taught to you, but because you're teaching somebody else and you have to explain it and you have to logic it out, then you have to go back and you look at what people are doing. And for me, you know, watching some of the best players in slow motion has completely eradicated advice that lots of coaches are giving because you're like, wait a second, all of the top athletes all are not doing it this way, or they are doing it this way. And that's not what people are teaching. And so that's when you have to take a step back and realize that. So I like that. I like that you're saying, like, make sure that you can teach what you're doing. And for us at Better at Beach, it's one of our main goals is if you're playing with us, right, and you're learning from us, but you can't explain it to the next athlete, we haven't done our job in helping the volleyball world, the community, the, the next generation. If I just tell you, do it, do it, do it, and that's all you learn, and you can't explain it to somebody else in a couple of different ways, we really haven't done our part in the sport for, for our goals. Mm -hmm. And I do like that, that you're saying that with, with entrepreneurialism as well, that you should be able to explain a lot of what you're doing and be uncomfortable in the beginning <laughs> until you get to that point and then find a new way to make yourself uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. with your communication, you know, I see, I know, you know, a lot of people may not know truly how hard you work on so many different aspects of your life and what you've put into, you know, being a professional athlete. And then now to starting to teach others to become 
or become better professional athletes. It's always interesting, the hard work that goes in behind it and your complete inspiration to see that. And it's how a lot of people really need to look at one aspect of their life and take it to that professional level to teach whatever it is. And, you know, that could be serving a ball, passing a ball, but if you, you may not be able to teach the whole game, but can you teach someone how to do an overhand move from an underhand serve to an overhand serve, you know, a very basic level. And then can you teach it to a kid and can you mm -hmm. teach it to an adult? And then can you teach it to a lefty? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yep. All different ways that you could start to say, well, what am I actually teaching? And I've seen you do that just to such an expert level that it's, it's awesome to uh, Thanks, man. That progression. Thanks. If somebody's thinking about, and this might have to do with the other podcast slash business that we're starting, I'm about to make myself hella uncomfortable. I just use the word hella out loud. Uncomfortable in starting another business called Entrepreneur Athlete. But if we could dive into that for just a second, what at the beginning of completely starting over? You know, you had your career as a firefighter and you, at how old were you? 38, 40? 41. 41. When you started a oh, when I started no 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 when you when you started a new a new situation gotcha right you started a completely new company in an industry that you had never been a part of that had never been in business you know you're firefighting what was the scariest part about making that change because I think a lot of athletes are going to relate to this and and I certainly will about coming towards the end of their playing career and saying now I have to redefine myself or something that has defined me since I was four years old, picking up Roman candles to see if any of them were still, you know, lightable. <laughs> Mischievous little boy. That was. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're, you're a firefighter. Like when you came out of the womb, but then you had to redefine yourself and go into a completely new industry. So what was the scariest part of that? And what did you tell yourself or who was there to help you overcome it? I would say one thing I really have in common with professional athletes of that level is, you know, and you go back to fight club, right? Like you are not your job. You are not your, your house, you know, and I actually at one point just kept reading that, you know, to disassociate myself from everything that I thought I was and wanted to be in my whole life. So there was a, a few very difficult years of like, oh my gosh, am I not going to be, you know, what am I going to do? So one of the scariest things for me was not having a passion, you know, like never getting to that risk level, that intensity level that I was so used to. And going from Brian, the firefighter and, you know, rescue firefighter to Brian, you know, the retired guy who has a face of a, you know, a gorgeous face of a 30 year old <laughs> uh, with the back of an 80 year old. <laughs> so I guess that was a tough thing is getting over that aspect of yourself. And I think professional athletes can say, hey, they're young. They feel like they could do it. They're mentally ready to do it. But either their body or competition is telling them you're not competing at this level. So finding a passion was really um, imperative. And then when I did find the passion. I didn't realize it for a while. You know, I was just so excited to start roasting. And then at some point, you know, 16, 17 hours a day of just research, reading, finding mentors, finding people who would ask questions. Lindsay came over and she's like, why don't you do coffee? Like you talk to people who are walking by babies and strollers about, you know, coffee and how to roast. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you do it? And then it was the risk of saying, okay, I'm going to do it. Because once you sit, I'm very similar to you. Like when you say you're going to do it, you're, once you say oh, I'm doing it, you're going to do it. Right. So mm -hmm. that's scary to take that jump. It's scary to tell people I am a coffee roasting professional because then you are a coffee roasting professional and you have the responsibility to do that in a professional manner. Yeah. Right. So saying you own a business is scary because you know, in six months, I'm going to ask you about your business. And what are you going to tell me? Oh, I never did that. Mm. That's scary to me. People looking at you like, you know, like you're full of BS. Yeah. Full of BS. You know, so it's scary to commit to something that's grand. Mm. Um, and then also being very new, not being brought up as a barista or through a roasting community and just completely going into an area where there are already personalities and professionals and not belittling their work, not taking away from it, but more so saying thank you for their work because it helped accelerate my process. Mm. It was really exciting. And now to start being someone who a resource that people are coming to is really cool. I think that that's so relatable for players who are starting to play. Like a lot of our audiences 
25, 30, and they're exploring beach volleyball or volleyball for the first time. And they're like, you know, and, and the line is that like, oh, we played these D1 players from, they played in college. So that's why they're kicking our butts. And to have that feeling like you're an imposter when there's so many people who have so much more experience than you is scary, but it also gives you an advantage in that you have to find unique or faster ways to match them than they have. And I, yeah. I think because I didn't play in high school, I played, you know, half a season in high school. I was like, I felt so far behind everybody. So I was just like, well, for me, it was just reps and coaching. I got into coaching to learn volleyball. So like when, uh, during my summers, it was, I have to learn how to play volleyball. How do I do that without spending hundreds on a coach? Oh, I know. I'll go and I'll coach for coaches. So I went around the country <laughs> and found like NCAA coaches who were running their summer camps. And I was like, Hey, I'll coach for you. Hey, I'll coach for you. And I would always throw in, you know, how much is the pay? And if they said we don't have any paid opportunities, I was still there, you know, because if I can learn quickly how they're coaching, then I'm getting all these hours, all these reps ahead of the people who are years ahead of me. And then you find that unique path to catch up. So if, if you guys are out there and you're worried about your new endeavor, your new path, your new life, changing your identity, just remember that you have an advantage that somebody who's been in it for years does not have and you're going to learn it in a unique way that they can't and i think that's important for people to hear in their lives it is and mark i also when started the coffee journey i you get to a point where you need more experience and after reading and learning it everything that i could online or to a healthy amount that you could online i found a, men a, a mentor and i walked into a place and he didn't know me from a hole in the wall and i said i told him a little bit about my story he says brian what are you looking for I need a mentor. Like I need somebody to actually test and ask these problems about. And he goes, okay, come in here as much as you want. And at the end of the day, we'll have a discussion and, and we'll do it. And it was, it starts from being service minded, right? Like first you give, don't expect to get anything from it. Don't walk into somewhere saying, I want this, this, this. That's in the back of your head. Like there's going to be a benefit. You don't know what that benefit was, but not to box yourself into knowing what the benefit was. I got so much experience from those conversations that I would have and continue to have with that mentor. It was just incredible. And then on the other side, similar, so similar to volleyball is get out there and get your touches in. Start for, for me, it was roasting coffee, start testing things, start understanding it, but you could read all you want and it, you could learn from the websites. You could watch personalities. You could watch your videos all you want until you get on the court and start doing it. Stop wasting too much time behind a computer, you know, stop continually trying to get all the information from other people. Start there, but then use it as a tool, like practice it, get your touches in. Love it. Big B, I think that's a good place to cut it. And that's probably our, our soundbite. <laughs> That'll be the hook at the beginning and at the end. That's perfect. <laughs> this is nice. good, Mark. I hope it was intensive on caffeine as we want it to be, but it's cool to always see the similarities uh, with where we are in life and share an hour and a half, which is more than we've shared I know. Uh, <laughs> for, for far too long. I know. We're getting it in, but we'll build our empires and then we'll merge them. That's it. Well, thank yeah. you. Guys, if you want the best tasting coffee in the entire world delivered to your doorstep and hand roasted by a hero and my brother head on over to traditioncoffeeroasters.com. Remember that we are offering a 10% discount coupon. Just enter better at beach in the checkout and would love to have your support. And you know, I'm just happy to introduce the world to my brother, somebody I love and somebody that I know uh, will never disappoint you if you become one of his his customers so head on over to traditioncoffeeroasters.com and coupon code better at beach right love you buddy love you too and just tell everybody next time you're on oahu stop by in kailua come by up to the roastery and i would love to see you mention this podcast and you're going to get a great big hug and 10 percent off so love awesome. you guys Hey, is there any way that people can reach out to you personally? Like if they have a coffee question or if they're just something as simple as like, how much grinds should I use for et cetera? Or, you know, what's the best espresso machine, anything, or do they want to learn about the coffee business or anything or where to visit in Oahu? Is there any way that they can specifically reach out to you? Yeah. So Brian at traditioncoffeeroasters.com. It's a long one. I'll talk about lessons learned another time, but Brian at tradition 
coffeeroasters.com uh, would be a great way to reach out. Again, mention, mention Mark, mention the podcast, or just mention your problem. And I love helping sort through that. It's a great way for me to connect and another excuse to talk about coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, and guys, they have an Instagram account. It's called Tradition Coffee Roasters, right? At Tradition Coffee Roasters on Instagram. That's right. Tradition Coffee Roasters. And and by the time this comes out, we're going to have your blend. I just want to start to keep sending you samples and keep it in your notes. I know you have uh, uh, notes about how you're feeling, what you eat. Keep it in there. Tell me if you get different feelings of intensity from different samples that I send you. Oh, cool. I'm in. The volley brew will come about. I love it. Yeah, baby. All right. Cool. Right. Say hi to the girls and love you. And we'll see you later. Everybody else, we'll see you on the sand. Thank you, everybody.